Good morning. Welcome to Skeptical 2021, day two. We have another great lineup today. After our keynote speaker, we have Britt Marie Hermes, Fake Doctor, Real Harm, Ross Blotcher, How to Start a Cult, Sunday Papers with Susan Gerbic, and Don't Miss Skeppardy with Bill Patterson and three special guests, one who you probably have not seen this week yet. Now, however, it is my pleasure to introduce a man you may have seen on national news often, including I'm sorry, educating the public on COVID-19, COVID-19 vaccines, and vaccines in general. Dr. Paul A. Offit is director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as the Maurice Hillman Professor of Vaccinology and Professor of Pediatrics at the Perman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Offit has published more than 160 papers in medical and scientific journals in the areas of rotavirus, specifically immune response and vaccine safety. He is also co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine, Rotatech, member of the Institute of Medical, I'm sorry, Medicine of the National Academies of Science and author of several award-winning books, including Bad Advice or Why Celebrities, Politicians and Activists Aren't Your Best Source of Health Information. Do You Believe in Magic? The Sense and Nonsense of Alternative Medicine, and Deadly Choices, How the how the Anti-Vaccine Movement Threatens Us All. Dr. Offit, welcome to Skeptical 2021. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is what I think all of us would like to uh, see happen, which is how can we best stop this COVID-19 pandemic, which in a word can be stopped by immunity. So there is the immunity induced by vaccination. Hopefully no one needs to be convinced that um, vaccines work. So this just looks at the, um, the um, likelihood of being protected against hospitalization based on age. And you can see that uh, if you look at the blue lines or the, those who are um, unvaccinated as compared to the uh, green lines or those who are fully vaccinated, you clearly are much better off being vaccinated than being unvaccinated. And then there's the immunity induced by natural infection which also works. Um, if you look at sort of CNN or MSNBC these days, they'll often show these numbers. And when they say 45 million people in the United States have been infected, what they really mean to say is 45 million people in the United States have been tested and found to be infected. When you do antibody surveillance studies, what you find is that number is off by at least a factor of two and probably higher. I think it's fair to say at least 100 million people in this country have already been infected with this virus. And um, here's a paper, um, titled Necessity of COVID-19 Vaccination in Previously Infected Individuals, looking at whether or not those who are previously infected are in fact protected, and they are. This was a study of 52,000 healthcare workers and the Cleveland Clinic healthcare system between December 2020 and May 2021. About 1,400 health workers were infected, but not subsequently vaccinated. And they found that in this fairly brief period of time, that there was no um, uh, symptomatic infection in those who had been previously vaccinated who were then subsequently exposed. And that has held up for at least um, a year at this point. Um, in this paper uh, Michael, by Michael Nusenswag and his co-workers that was published recently in, um, in Nature. Now, um, there also is the immunity induced by disease plus vaccination. This was a study that was done um, in Kentucky, looking at people who were naturally infected and then vaccinated. And what they found was that those who were subsequently vaccinated decreased their chance of then having an infection later by a little more than uh, twofold. And this supported the notion that the CDC recommendation that all eligible persons be offered COVID-19 vaccination, regardless of previous SARS-CoV-2 infection status. But in truth, um, whether you've been naturally infected or vaccinated, you have a very, very a high likelihood of being protected against serious illness, meaning the kind of illness that causes you to seek medical attention or go to the hospital or go to the ICU or go to the morgue. So, so what does it take to get herd immunity? By herd immunity, what I mean is that there are, are enough of, of people in this country, the percentage of population is high enough that has been protected either from natural infection or immunization that dramatically slows the spread of this virus from one person to the next. So as of mid-October, about 405 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine administered, about 57% of the population is fully vaccinated. At least 100 million people have been naturally infected. These aren't two separate groups. They're overlapping groups. But I think it's fair to say that if you combine the immunity induced by disease with that induced by immunization, at least 75% of this country is protected against serious illness. So is that enough? 
or said another way, what percentage of the population needs to be immune to induce herd immunity? There's actually a formula for this, and it depends on two facts. One is the contagiousness of the virus. Obviously, the more contagious the virus, the greater the percentage of the population that needs to be uh, protected. The particular variant that's circulating now, the Delta variant, is a highly transmissible virus. I mean, it has a, an R0, a contagiousness index of between five and nine. So if you take the lower value there, five, that what that means is that I've, I'm infected with SARS-CoV-2. I go about my normal day. Everybody I come in contact with is susceptible to the virus. I'll infect five people. And then they'll go on to infect five more. Um, this is this is is uh, far more infectious or contagious than was the ancestral strain, meaning the strain that originally came into this country, which was actually the first variant. It was the D614G variant. In any case, we're talking with the Delta variant about a, a virus that's as transmissible, pretty much as transmissible as chickenpox, which is highly transmissible. Although you see what the most transmissible of the uh, vaccine preventable diseases is on the right, measles. Okay, so, so the formula used to determine, determine the percentage of the population that needs to be immune to be effectively to effectively stop the spread of the virus is R0, the contagious index, minus one over R0, divided by the effectiveness of the vaccine, preferably to prevent against contagiousness. So if you use the best possible numbers, assume an R0 of five, assume a vaccine efficacy against uh, contagiousness of 90%, which is generous, then, then you get five minus one divided by five, which is 0.8, divided by 0.9, which is the effectiveness of the vaccine. And, and you get really about not, at least 90% of the population would need to be immune. I think we need to vaccinate at least another 40 million people if we want to effectively stop this, the spread of this virus. So there's about 65 million people out there who haven't been vaccinated. This includes children too, by the way. So the uh, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, I'm actually still on that committee, we will be meeting on Tuesday to discuss uh, the recommendation for the five to 11 year old. Okay, so I think there are three obstacles to herd immunity. We'll go through them one at a time. The first obstacle is variants. Um, there are the, the, first, the virus that really raised its head in Wuhan um, was was not the virus that left uh, uh, China. The virus that left China was the first variant, the so-called D614G variant. It never got a uh, Greek letter designation. That's the one that swept across Asia, swept across Europe, swept across the United States, killed about 200,000 people here, and was eventually replaced by the next variant, which is the alpha variant, um, which um, was, was more contagious, more transmissible than the uh, original strain. And then that was replaced by the Delta variant, which is far more contagious, actually, than either of those first two variants. And that now counts, I think it's a somewhat older slide. It says 94% here, but it's really about 98% of circulating strains. To be perfectly honest, now Delta Plus has raised its head in UK. It's accounted for about 8% of cases. Um, it's hard to imagine a virus much more contagious than Delta, frankly, but we'll see how the Delta Plus plays out. Obstacle number two is misinformation, which is what I want to spend most of the time on here. Um, this is the um, the uh, the um, tragedy of the internet. Honey, come look! I found some information all the world's top doc scientists and doctors missed. This is part of what we're up against, the scourge of social media. So, in any case, we'll go through a few. One, COVID nineteen vaccines aren't necessary for children. Um, when the virus first first came into this country, um, the children were not a focus. Over the last few weeks, they have been. Um, we've had anywhere between 150 and 250,000 cases in children a week. It's meant as many as 2,000 hospitalizations a week. Children now have more than 600 children have died from this virus. And when the virus first came in, it accounted for really uh, children accounted for fewer than 3% of cases. Now it's actually about 27% of cases. So this is a childhood illness. Um, this was a study that was done looking at adolescents that were admitted to the hospital um, back uh, in March, April. And what they looked, they found was that of these 204 adolescents that were hospitalized, nearly a third required intensive care unit admission, 5% required mechanical ventilation. And a third of these people, uh, these adolescents, had no known risk factors that put them at high, higher risk of severe illness. And then there's multi-system inflammatory disease, which is frankly the most common reason to come in our, our hospital that has involved more than 5,000 uh, children. Now, typically this starts as an asymptomatic or mild infection. The children resolve that infection, but then a month later come back with basically multi-system involvement, including lungs, liver, kidney, heart. And this too has been associated with death. It's pretty frightening to watch, actually. These kids are quite ill. 
And then there's the, the, the social price that has been paid, I think, probably by children more than any other. They have certainly suffered this kind of social isolation, as has been reflected by an increase in teen suicide, um, at, at least in, in Philadelphia here. Um, often the um, only decent meal children get during the day is their school lunch. And um, child abuse is often only recognized typically in the school. And that has also, these, those children have also suffered for those reasons. And virtual learning is just not as good as on-site learning. Okay, next, this is one of the most common questions I get, get asked is COVID-19 vaccines decrease fertility. I'm not sure what's gonna make this false notion go away. Um, I actually would not bet about this in the Hill a while ago, but in any case, the fear was born when two researchers petitioned the European Medicines Agency or EMA, which is a, sort of a roughly equivalent to the uh, United States as FDA, to withdraw approval for COVID-19 vaccines claiming that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein shared genetic sequences with a protein called syncytion-1, which is a protein on placental cells that's important for placental health. First of all, that's not right. Um, those, those two genetic sequences are quite distinct. It's like saying you and I have the so, same social security number because they both contain the number five. And because they're not similar, therefore, these two proteins are immunologically distinct. Another way to look at this is, is when um, Pfizer and Moderna did their phase three trials, although pregnancy was really... Um, you were, you were pregnant women were, were actually not a part of this trial, and women were asked not to become pregnant during the, this trial. But nonetheless, as Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. And there were about three dozen pregnancies during these trials. If it was true that, that the vaccine um, decreased fertility, then there should have been more of those instances of pregnancies in the placebo group, but they were divided equally uh, 18 and 18 which just basically just shows that um, the vaccine neither enhanced nor negatively infected um, pregnancy. And, and also, if we're arguing that antibodies directed against the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein are deleterious to the placenta, more than 100 million people have been infected over the past year and a half. So what's happened to the birth rate? And the answer is the birth rate has stayed the same. When you're naturally infected, you're also making antibodies to that spike protein. And then in theory, antibodies to the, the placenta, which obviously you're not doing. Okay, the next is that uh, COVID-19 vaccines altered DNA. I mean, it's, it's sort of understandable how this came about. Normally, when you're trying to get someone to make an immune response, in this case, to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, you can give them a live weakened form of the virus, like the measles vaccine, or you can give them a whole killed form of the virus, like the, the polio vaccine, or you can give them the protein itself made, you know, using recombinant DNA technology, uh, like which is the way we make the hepatitis B vaccine or the human papillomavirus vaccine. But in all cases, you're giving the protein, you're giving the viral protein. That's not what you're doing here. Either with the mRNA vaccines or with the Johnson & Johnson's vectored virus vaccine, you're giving the gene that codes for the protein. That gene then is translated to a protein. So your body makes the protein, and then your body makes an antibody response to that protein. So these are really the first of the genetic vaccines. And I think the minute you use the term genetic, people think, uh-oh, this is going to alter my DNA. So we'll use the um, mRNA vaccines as an example. Um, so so the, the mRNA vaccine, in this case, I'm just showing Moderna's, but uh, are lipid encapsulated. The, um, it's taken up into the cytoplasm of cells, primarily a cell type called dendritic cells, which is an antigen presenting cell. It's then uncoded. And then that's, that single strand of messenger RNA joins 200,000 other pieces of messenger RNA that are in your cytoplasm, making the enzymes and proteins we need to live. And then that, that mRNA enters the ribosomal system. It's translated to a protein for a few days, which is put on the cell surface. And that's pretty much it. Then the, the mRNA degrades. Um, in order for it to alter the DNA, first it has to get into the nucleus, which is where the DNA resides. Um, but it can't because it doesn't have a nuclear access signal. Similarly, even if it got into the nucleus, which it can't, it has its RNA, it's not DNA. So it would have to be reverse transcribed to DNA, which requires an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which it also doesn't have. Even if it was reverse transcribed to, to DNA, which it can't be, it would need to be integrated into DNA to make a change, which requires the en enzyme integrase, which it also doesn't have. So really, there's, it's not like there's a small chance that mRNA could affect your DNA. There's a 0% chance, although I never quite understand why it is that people feel that, uh, that this can only make you, you worse. I mean, why isn't it that your genes can be altered so that you can have x-ray vision or become a Spider-Man? Although, you know, we at the, the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we never like to stray too far to this, from the science. So you become Spider-Man when you're bitten by a radioactive spider. 
Okay, next is the COVID-19 vaccine shouldn't be given during pregnancy. It's interesting to watch the way this has played out. I mean, first of all, pregnant women should have been studied during the phase three trials. I mean, pregnant women are at a high risk of, of a higher risk of being hurt by this virus, but they weren't. And typically when pregnant women are not part of trials, and they often never are, when they, the, the vaccine then rolls out, the CDC will say contraindicated for use in pregnant women because um, we don't have data. But they didn't do that here, and that's, this slide shows why. Compared with women of the same age who are not pregnant, pregnant women are three times more likely to require ICU care, two to three times more likely to require intubation, mechanical ventilation, or ECMO support, and 1.5-fold uh, more likely to die from this virus as compared to pregnant women, uh, as compared to uh, women who aren't pregnant of the same age. So for that reason, when this vaccine rolled out, the CDC didn't say it was contraindicated in pregnant women. Rather, what they said was that a pregnant woman could reasonably choose to get this vaccine. And that's what happened. Thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of pregnant women did make that choice, which gave then researchers like Tim Shimabakura at the CDC a chance to look at compare women who were pregnant and got the vaccine as compared to women who were pregnant that didn't get the vaccine to see whether there were any differences in pregnancy outcomes, pregnancy complications, or neonatal complications, like in the case of pregnancy, miscarriage, or stillbirth, in the case of pregnancy complications, gestational diabetes, eclampsia, or intrauterine growth retardation, or as far as the neonate was concerned, preterm birth, congenital abnormalities, neonatal death, or small for gestational age, none of which was true. So once that happened, then the CDC changed its recommendation to that they recommended the vaccine for pregnant women. And more recently, over the past couple of weeks, because many pregnant women have actually been admitted to the hospital and have either died from this virus or delivered their babies severely prematurely, um, the CDC has created an urgent call for pregnant women to get vaccinated. Okay, one of my favorites, the COVID-19 vaccines cause people to be magnetic. So here is an anti-vaccine activist named Sherry Tenpenny testifying in front of the Ohio lawmakers claiming the COVID-19 vaccine makes people magnetic. Honestly, I think the anti-vaccine activists, I mean, the leaders, I just all sort of see them uh, in, in some back room betting each other on what they could get people to believe. But Sherry Tenpenny was able to get people to believe that, as was shown by another woman who testified at this meeting. Okay, um, so how about this? mRNA vaccines contain lipids, potassium chloride, monobasic potassium phosphate, sodium chloride, dibasic sodium phosphate dihydrate, and sucrase, none of which are paramagnetic. Professor Michael Cooley from the School of Physics at Trinity College, Dublin, has stated, quote, you would need about one gram of iron metal to attract and support a permanent magnet at the injection site, something you would easily feel if it was there. Joe Swartz, who's a PhD, who you, I'm sure you all know, from the Office of Science and Sci Society at McGill University, a brilliant chemist who writes a number of wonderful books, making chemistry, the chemistry of daily life um, palatable and fun for the general population, has stated, quote, our liver which is loaded with iron, isn't ripped out of our body when we get a magnetic resonance imaging scan, is it? And people who get iron injections or take iron supplements, which do contain ferrous or ferric um, ions that are paramagnetic, do not become magnetized. And there's Joe showing how you can really get metal things to stick to yourself even when you're not, mag when you're not magnetic. Okay, then this one, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is itself a toxin. This is all over the internet. I'm just picking on this one uh, doctor because um, he seems to be most prominent, sort of pushing forward this false notion. But he said, quote, terrifying new research uh, finds vac vaccine spike protein unexpectedly in the bloodstream. The protein, uh, first of all, it's not unexpected. Secondly, the protein is linked to blood clots, heart, and brain damage. So like, it's hard to find where this actually came from, but most people sort of uh, that are pushing this tend to put, point to this particular paper in circulation research where mice were inoculated intratracheally, meaning in the windpipe, with an extraordinarily high quantity, 500 million platform units, of a pseudovirus uh, called vesicular stomatitis virus, which is in the same family as uh, rabies viruses, expressing the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So when they did this, when these researchers did this, they found that there were a number of abnormalities in mice which shows you, I think, that you shouldn't, uh, in people, inoculate them in their windpipe with uh, 500 million platforming units of vesicular stomatitis virus expressing SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. You know, I really, uh, having done a lot of work uh, with experimental animals and our work on rotavirus vaccines, when you do work in experimental animals, you try and do everything you can to mimic the natural situation, to mimic what would happen in, in, uh, uh, in humans. 
because uh, you know the uh, animal model work often isn't predictive of people in uh, people. I mean, the, when uh, Jesse Gelsinger had died of uh, gene therapy, that 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 gene therapy product had been tested in many uh, experimental animals, including non-human primates. Uh, simian virus 40 was found to be a cause of cancer in guinea pigs, but not people. Um, so th as David Weiner, who is a uh, professor uh, at the uh, Wistar Institute in Philadelphia, I think sums it up best when he says, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. If mice were predictive of man, we would have had an AIDS vaccine about 30 years ago. Okay, then this, according to the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, COVID-19 vaccines kill people. The Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System is a passive system co-directed by the CDC and FDA, where if you believe you've had a side effect, you can just fill out a one-page form now on the internet and send it in. And there is no screening. I mean, you can fill out a form saying, uh, my 15-year-old got a COVID-19 vaccine and within one week became the Incredible Hulk, and that will end up on the system. You can find it in the system. There is no deleting anything. So it's uh, at best, it's extremely noisy. At worst, it's incredibly misleading. So here's Tucker Carlson on May 6, 2021. Um, on Fox News saying, quote, 3,362 people apparently died after getting the COVID-19 vaccine. More people, according to VAERS, have died after getting the COVID-19 shot than from all the other vaccines. So was Tucker right? So there's about 750 deaths in the United States per 100,000 per year. Therefore, two people die per 100,000 per day by May the 6th, 2021, when Tucker Carlson made his proclamation to his followers, his 3 million followers on Fox News, 110 million people in the United States had been vaccinated. Therefore, 2,200 people would have been expected to die within 24 hours of receiving that vaccine and 4,400 within 48 hours of receiving the vaccine, unless the vaccines conferred immortality. But they don't. This is the problem with all vaccines. They're only designed to prevent vaccine preventable diseases, not everything else that occurs in life. So the 3,300 deaths claimed by Carlson to have been caused by the vaccines are exactly what one have expected, assuming that the vaccines killed nobody. This actually came up with Hank Aaron very early in the vaccine uh, rollout. Um, here was an, a man in his mid-80s who died of a stroke two weeks after getting a vaccine. And there were some in the news that carried that as a possible consequence of vaccination, which it wasn't. Okay, next, and this is my particular favorite one, actually, just because it was in the news recently, that vaccinated teachers are dangerous to students. This from the Sentner Academy, the ironically named brain school, where the headmaster of that school basically prohibited teachers, vaccinated teachers from coming into the school for a month. And now over the last 24 or 48 hours has prohibited students who are vaccinated from coming into the school for at least a month. Why? Because when you're vaccinated, according to the Sentner Academy, the brain school, you are um, shedding SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins from your body and that that spike protein is toxic to other people. Now, this is not a live attenuated viral vaccine. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't shed at all. Um, it's just like any other protein in your body. Any protein you make, like insulin or hemoglobin, um, is made in the cytoplasm and then uh, put, put into, into, uh, into the place where that protein needs to be. That's, that's the way it works. I mean, I, I only wish there were, this were true. I mean, if this were true, as this headmaster said, then, um, then if someone had insulin-dependent diabetes, they would just have to stand next to somebody who's making normal insulin. They wouldn't have to get their insulin shots. Or if someone has sickle cell disease, they could just stand next to someone who's making normal hemoglobin and get all the hemoglobin they need. But it doesn't work that way. Uh, the misinformation of Popery, really the, the one that started it all was this 26-minute uh, film that was released on May the 4th of uh, 2020 called Plandemic, which made, which really gave birth to a lot of the false notions that have persisted, like hydroxychloroquine cures COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 was manipulated to create a pandemic strain, because we want to believe amid the chaos that is this pandemic, that there is an order to this. This is a, There is a sense to this. And I think that's what this kind of movie appeals to. See, it, here's how we can explain it all. There, there, was, there were evil forces working behind the scenes that created all this that the influenza vaccine increases the chance of getting COVID-19, that the influenza vaccine contains SARS-CoV-2, that microbes in the ocean cure COVID-19, that wearing a protective mask activates SARS-CoV-2. Actually, um, Louis Gohmert, who's a congressman from Texas, believes that his 
um, his SARS-CoV-2 infection was caused by wearing a mask, that Bill Gates created SARS-CoV-2 pandemic so that he could make money selling vaccines to prevent it because presumably $60 billion wasn't enough for him, and that COVID-19 death statistics have been manipulated to control the public. So that provides order out of chaos, even though it's completely wrong and just appeals to that conspiracy theory notion of ours, which seems to be pretty broad and deep. Um, but as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, I'm sure you all know this quote, it's my favorite, you can't use logic and reason to convince someone out of an argument that they didn't use logic and reason to get into. Okay, then obstacle number three, and I'm just the last few slides, the sort of claims to personal freedom. Th this actually bothers me more than anything. It's, it's, not, it's not your freedom to catch and transmit a potentially fatal infection. You're not just acting on for yourself. I mean, if you if you step on a rusty nail and you decide you don't want a tetanus vaccine and you get tetanus, that's a personal choice because no one's gonna catch tetanus from you. It's not a contagious disease. SARS-CoV-2 is a highly contagious virus. So you're making a decision for those with whom you come in contact. And this is this sort of notion of bodily autonomy, you know, this medical tyranny, forced vaccines. Um, you know, as, as Oliver Wendell Holmes says, your right to swing your fist ends at the tip of my nose. This is nothing new. I mean, this notion of um, personal liberty dates back well into the uh, late 1800s with uh, outrage against uh, the smallpox vaccine mandates. So what does is, what is personal freedom look like? So here's an example at the end of August of, of this year in Springfield, Oregon, long-term care outbreak infects 64, kills five, which began with one unvaccinated employee at a time when we'd had a vaccine for about nine months. Or this teacher who, who was occasionally unmasked, who stood in front of her classroom with Delta virus, which she then proceeded to infect 12 of the 24 children in her classroom. Once again, proving, as you can see on the left-hand portion of the slide, why you should never sit in the first two rows of any classroom. But this was reported out of Marin County, California, um, in, also in August. So this is the URL of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I will stop right there and thank you for your attention. Although I actually have no idea whether you were paying attention because I can't see anything but myself. Okay, thanks. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Offit. And uh, you can close down your slideshow if that's blocking your screen. Thank you very much. So um, interesting on the quote uh, from Goldblum in Jurassic Park, Life Found a Way. Uh, with current misinformation on the internet, I have a saying, Darwin found a way, you know, with 90% of our uh, hospitals uh, deaths being the unvaccinated. So uh, first question, some of us are still not comfortable being indoors without masks, even if we're vaccinated. Is that being overly cautious? No, well, I, I sort of fall into that category. I mean, I, I'm vaccinated, not shockingly. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're, when you're, first of all, no vaccine is 100% effective. Uh, and, and the vaccine, certainly immunity starts to wane, at least against um, asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection over time. Um, and when you're indoors and there are other people there, I mean, when I go to the grocery store here about a block away, I mean, I, I wear a mask because um, I, I see maskless people there. I'm asked to assume that they're, they're vaccinated, which I think is a big assumption. So I, I wear a mask indoors. Um, and, and I guess will until I feel more comfortable. And I'm not sure what line has to be crossed for me to feel more comfortable. But I do think immunization or, or that, uh, that infection rates and hospitalization rates are starting to come down. Now, that's happened before. So I don't want to get too excited. But, you know, we're heading into winter, which is why it's odd that they would be coming down now. I, I think after we get past this winter, as we see, as we head into next spring, I'd like to think with more people vaccinated this, through these uh, mandates, we'll, we'll start to get on top of this pandemic. And, and then I think I'll feel more comfortable. All right. Great. Uh, knowing what we know now about how COVID-19 uh, misinformation has spread, given a time machine, what could the medical and science community done better to educate the public over the last 18 months? I, I don't know what how we could have done better, frankly. I mean, I think, well, let me take a step back. I, I think this is an amazing vaccine. It really is. I mean, it, the, the virus was isolated and sequenced in January of 2020. We had two large clinical trials, Pfizer and Moderna, 30,000, 40,000 people. Within 11 months, you know, we were told on the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee that if, if we had a vaccine, we're asked to consider a vaccine that was 50% effective with a lower bound of 30%, we would approve it. Dr. Fauci, a few months before we met, had said he was optimistic we could have, have a vaccine that was 70% effective. Now, 
nine months into this vaccine, 10 months into this vaccine since December. Um, in terms of protection against severe disease, this vaccine has held up into the 80 to 90% range for all age groups through Delta. It's remarkable. Nonetheless, we continue to have these amazing communication errors. We should have never used the term breakthrough to describe a mild or asymptomatic infection. If that, that's a breakthrough, then every vaccine has, break, has, has a lot of breakthroughs because most vaccines are designed like this one to prevent serious illness. So we sort of damned the vaccine in, in that sense. We I mean, hear you, Brett Kavanaugh gets two doses of a vaccine and then, you know, gets a quote unquote breakthrough illness, which for him was an asymptomatic infection. That's a win. Congratulations. I mean, Lindsey Graham, I just like to keep quoting uh, conservatives because how often do you get to do that? But Lindsey Graham got this right. I mean, he said, despite being fully vaccinated um, and he got a mild upper respiratory tract infection that included sinusitis, at which he said, quote, it would have been much worse if I hadn't been vaccinated. Right. That's what you expect from this vaccine. So that was the first mistake. Don't use the term breakthrough. It was born in that Provincetown outbreak where, you know, 346 people, all vaccinated, had mild or asymptomatic infection, but four of them, or 1.2%, were hospitalized. That's a breakthrough. That 1.2% that is breakthrough, which is great. I mean, you still have a vaccine that's working well. Secondly, we made a mistake, and it was with the Provincetown outbreak of saying, the CDC did this, of saying that, that those who were vaccinated who had, an asymptom who had a mildly symptomatic infection were just as contagious as those who were unvaccinated and had a mildly symptomatic infection. That's wrong. And the this, this Singapore study clearly showed that was wrong. The third thing is when President Biden stood up on August 18th and said, we are going to have a, vac a third dose vaccine for everyone over 16 years of age on September 20th, thus basically making everybody think that two doses wasn't being fully vaccinated, whereas it is being fully vaccinated. I mean, I think you can argue people over 65 years of age could reasonably get a third dose of vaccine, but that's pretty much it. I mean, we, I know we also recommend it for those over 50 who have high risk uh, medical conditions to put them at risk, a greater risk of serious illness. But there really aren't even the data there to support that. Two doses appears to work for the mRNA vaccines. I do think the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was always a two-dose vaccine. I mean, when we considered that vaccine at the end of February, they were in the midst of a two-dose trial, which was, was almost finished. So that's a two-dose vaccine. But um, I, I just don't understand the sort of booster mania that we have now. I just don't think it's really solidly based. Um, but, but for those over 65, I think it's reasonable. The Israeli data support that, but not much else. So it seems like there's a lot of nuance, and, and in some cases, a lot of basics are just missed by the by the general public. Uh, going to YouTube here from uh, Dr. Eugenie Scott has the question. So many crazy stuff shows up on VAERS. Is there something that might be done to reduce the misinformation? Um, eliminate VAERS. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the VAERS is just used by the anti, the, you know, the, the VAERS was created in 1986 with the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act that went into place in 1980. That was really the anti-vaccine groups that really who pushed for that. They wanted VAERS and they've been using VAERS ever since to scare the hell out of people. Um, I mean, it, it, the, the anti-vaccine people constantly point to VAERS to say, look at all this horrible stuff. I mean, we're going to be voting on vaccines for the 5 to 11-year-old on Tuesday. And I'm not kidding. In the past 24 hours, Eugenie, I have had more than 1,000 emails from this coordinated campaign to get me to vote no. Um, I, I don't know how I'm going to vote. We'll, we'll discuss the data on Tuesday and we'll see. But, you know, it's just this, this, and it's all VAERS. They all send me this VAERS. Look, look at all this stuff that, that's happening because they can't. Because VAERS doesn't distinguish coincidence from causality, and and neither do they. So it's painful. By the way, the, the term pandemic, when I was looking through the data on the pandemic, I saw the term gish gallop, which I'm pretty sure Eugenie is yours. And that's just, I love that term. So thank you. Yes, Dr. Jeannie Scott with the gish gallop. Yes, very memorable. So uh, next question from uh, Ross Blotcher. Put in on our hypothetical hats, if we could affect a perfect quarantine for two weeks, could we nip this thing in the bud? Um, in order to do that, um, you would have to have, I think what you would need to do is provide to everyone in this country who asks a, an antigen detection kit for free. Do that. That's essentially what they do in the United Kingdom. And then if you have a cold and you think you might have been exposed and then you test them, because the antigen kit, kit is better than PCR. PCR is only detecting genome. With the antigen, at least you're closer to the notion that you are actually shedding whole virus and infectious virus, and then quarantine yourself. You, you could that, that would probably be a, a reasonable way to do it, but that's not the way it's going to play out here. Remember, most people who are who are who are transmitting this virus are asymptomatic. That's the problem with this virus. You know, SARS one never be although it was a pandemic potential virus, 
never became a pandemic, nor did MERS, which raised its head 10 years later, also another pandemic potential virus, coronavirus. They never became uh, a, pan a pandemic because all disease basically was moderate or severe. So it's very easy to tell who was infected. That's the problem with this infection. It's asymptomatic. And it's really hard to get around that um, by getting everybody to get an antigen kit because <laughs> you can asymptomatically transmit this virus. Okay, great. Uh, next question from YouTube. Uh, it's actually from uh, Susan Gerbic. I think Hi, you might Susan. know Susan. From uh, Actually, and she has a question from uh, Penny Trainer. Uh, she wanted to ask, do we know if infants are protected when their mother was vaccinated while pregnant? And if so, how long? Right. So, so if you're, you're, va if you're vaccinated pregnant, uh, as a pregnant woman, um, you will start to transfer um, immunoglobulin G directed against SARS-CoV-2 spike protein to your infant at about 32 weeks gestation. So for starting from the last two months of pregnancy, you will transfer immunoglobulin G that is specific for that virus to your infant circulation. The half-life of passively transferred immunoglobulin G is about 21 to 25 days. But you probably have, you're probably protecting that infant at, at least for the first six months of life with that passive transfer, may possibly for as long as nine months, because although you're many half-lives down the road, there's probably still enough functional antibody to protect the child. So the short answer is yes, and probably six months, nine months at the longest. Okay, great. Uh, let see, Carl Foxhaven. Again, from YouTube, you mentioned that the portion of infections in kids went from 3 to 27%. Is there evidence that newer variants are more infectious in kids? Or is the jump coming from a higher percentage of adults vaccinated? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. It's clear, though, that the Delta variant has reached into a fully susceptible group. I mean, children less than 12 are don't have the the uh, advantage of a vaccine so they are fully susceptible and i think that's a large well, you know this, this is a clever virus that finds out who's susceptible and, and attacks them and that that's where we are now I, I i find it so hard to watch these you know these sort of parent groups you know opposing mask mandates opposing vaccine you know requirements it's just hard to watch i'll be i'm, I'm curious to see how the, the the um this plays out with children actually um you know, we'll consider the data for the five to eleven year old on Tuesday, and, and you know, it's it is hard. I should be perfectly honest. When when you consider, so for example, Pfizer's data, which we did on December the tenth, in adults, it was a forty thousand person study. The study we're going to look at on Tuesday is essentially a twenty two hundred and fifty child study, two to one vaccine to placebo. So the numbers are much smaller. And then you're asked to make a decision for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of children uh, based on a, a smaller sample size. So as always, you know, in the world of, of science and medicine, the issue isn't when do you know everything, it's when do you know, know enough. Do we think we know enough to move forward with this vaccine? Um, and we'll see how this plays out. I think it's going to be pretty a pretty interesting meeting on Tuesday. All and right. it is televised. I mean, I or at least on YouTube or C-SPAN or something. I mean, I miss the days when I first signed up for the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee when we just picked flu strains and nobody gave a shit. I mean, that was <laughs> I mean now we're like suddenly, suddenly on C-SPAN. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Thomas Westbrook from uh, Holy Kool-Aid. You said people who are infected first, then also vaccinated are better protected. But what about if it's one or the other? How does natural immunity compare to vaccination in terms of protection? Yeah, that's the question of the day. I mean, I can tell you the administration also is, is thinking about how to handle this. Because, it, it, for example, in our hospital, we have a vaccine mandate. If somebody comes to us and says, look, I'm naturally infected. If you look at studies by Michael Nusenzweig or John Weary or others, I am protected against serious illness. I am. I have a frequency of memory B and T cells in my, my body that approaches that of, of, of vaccination. I am protected. Now, I know that you're saying that that if I got a vaccine after being naturally infected, that I boost my neutralizing antibody titers, true, and that lessens my risk of asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection, also true, but I don't care. I mean, if I get an asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection, I'm always wearing a, high, a, a mask around the hospital, so I, I, I'm, I'm good. Um, you know, I think it's, 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 you can understand the argument at some level. Um, however, if you're going to work around the hospital, that's different. On the other hand, if you're at Tyson Foods, I mean, does, you know, can you make that same argument? I, I um, it, it's, we need to define what is the goal of this vaccine. If, if the goal of the vaccine is to protect, protect against serious illness, then we're doing that. And we don't need boosters. Um, 
if the goal of the vaccine is to prevent against mild infection or asymptomatic infection, then you're talking about frequent boosters. And I'm not sure that's the way we want to go. But I think it's, it is clear that if you if you give a vaccine on top of being naturally infected, you actually do, in addition to increase your neutralizing antibody titers and decreasing your risk of asymptomatic or bodily symptomatic infection, you also broaden your immunity to some extent against these sort of variants of concern. So there's clearly an advantage to doing that. What I wish the CDC would come up with, though, since there's about five studies that have shown this, you really only need one dose of vaccine. You only need one dose of an mRNA vaccine because that acts in you, the naturally infected person, like a second dose. So I, I wish they would they would do that because they, they certainly support that. But I just think it's been so confusing bureaucratically, especially in the face of mandates, to sort out the single dose versus two doses that they just basically say get two doses. Okay. Uh, from uh, Joel Schmalt from uh, Sacramento Skeptics. Is there something about an injection that triggers fear in a way the pill does not? Yes, I think that's how. I mean, I was fortunate enough to be part of a team at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that that um, invented the, the uh, rotavirus vaccine. It's an oral vaccine. I mean, there's it, oh, you yeah. watch the way that these vaccines. It's just given as a little squirt in the mouth. It's suspended in 50% sucrose, so it's delicious. Um, but um, very little pushback to, to an oral vaccine. I think that's absolutely true. Um, it's through the oral polio vaccine. We don't use that in the country anymore, but. We did up until 2000. Yes, I think people. It, it, it's just it's it's perception, you know that 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 if you if you inject it into your arm, for example, or leg, that there your body is not given a chance to reject it. Whereas if you take it orally, your body, you know, it's in the intestinal mucosal surface, but your body could choose or not choose to take it up, right? I mean, that's I think that's part of it. And also, you know, the you know vaccine vaccines injections hurt. Okay, uh, from Nick Viner. What would trigger the development of a new vaccine for a new COVID variant? Great question. I mean, well, first of all, that's the advantage of the mRNA technology or the vector virus technology is just plug in the mRNA, in this case, for the, the Delta variant. So you could have argued when we were making these booster dose recommendations, why not boost with, you know, with an mRNA or vector virus that has the Delta variant SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in there? Um, we didn't, but you could have reasonably argued that we could have. I think that the good thing about these vaccines is that um, for all three variants, D614G, Alpha, Delta, even though this vaccine was made really against the ancestral strain, I mean, the, Wu, the Wuhan 2020 strain, um, they work very well protecting against serious illness. With the Delta, you're a little more off target. And that, that's why the protection isn't quite as good against uh, all symptomatic infections as it was for the first two. But I, I'm not sure what the, the trigger is going to be. I, I, we're going to see how this plays out over the next probably six months and have a much better idea of where to go. And then we may not end with Delta. The Delta is our third variant in a period of a year and a half. The good news about coronavirus is, although you've never know this from reading the media, um, it actually is a fairly slow mutator. I mean, it's not anywhere in the vicinity of flu. I mean, flu, you get a flu vaccine every year because even if you've been naturally infected or even if you've been vaccinated the previous year, you're not protected against serious disease the next year. And so that's why you get uh, for the basically new viruses that, that arise every year. That's why you get a yearly flu vaccine. Here, I think you're, you're going to be protected against serious disease for a while and maybe many years. We'll learn that over time because this virus isn't going anywhere. I mean, it's at least going to be endemic for years, I would think. And remember, we still have a polio vaccine in this country. We haven't had a case of polio in this country since the 1970s. Why do we give a polio vaccine every year to children in our country? Because it still exists in Pakistan and Afghanistan. I mean, there are many countries out there that haven't given a single dose of vaccine yet, which is, to me, why this whole booster thing is even more mm. depressing. I, you know, that I think we would do better for ourselves, even just if we weren't being altruistic, we would be doing better for this country if we just took that vaccine and sent it to those places. Right. That needed. Uh, so I have a, an acquaintance, medical professional, not, a, not an MD. Uh, maybe you can clear something up for uh, this person who uh, says the virus is smaller than what the N95 mask can filter. Therefore, the filter is no good. Well, the virus isn't excreted by itself. It's excreted in a, in a droplet, a small droplet, which is for the most part captured. There, there are a number of studies that have looked at masking and different, different kinds of masking in terms of what you, what you can filter out. I mean, the general sort of that sort of rectangular surgical mask is about 85% effective as, as, as going up to like an N95 mask, which is about like 98% effective. So they're effective. It's just, they're not completely effective, but they're, they're definitely effective. You don't excrete individual viral particles. You discrete, excrete viruses in small droplets. And in the case of say smallpox, you excrete viruses in large droplets. Yeah, so every little bit helps, every measure. Uh, see, Thomas Klein, 
At this late date, uh, why do we have no clue why some people are asymptomatic while others get severe disease? Um, we're an outbred population. I, you know, I, I'm sure that there is, there are sort of genetic haplotypes that are more that that over time will be found to be more or less susceptible to this virus. We're outbreds. Uh, Eugenie Scott again, and she's relaying for a friend. Uh, what's a sound bit to help me change parents' mind who will take their children out of school rather than vaccinate? Yeah, I mean, it, there, there are so many advantages to on-site learning. Uh, you know, just you learn better, you get to be around your friends. I mean, it, it's um, the the... The, the, you now, I, see, I, here's what I, I can understand. So, so uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine was originally uh, approved down to 16 years of age. So you, you have a lot of data out there now in the 16 to 17 year old. Then we approved the vaccine for the 12 to 15 year old. Now that was really just based on a 2300 child study. Half got the vaccine, half didn't. That was a one-to-one -one study. So only about 1200 children got that vaccine before it was approved for use by the FDA. Uh, I think a parent at that point could reasonably say, you know what? Let me just wait a beat here to see whether or not there's any problem that plays out, because you know with the mRNA vaccines that there was a problem with myocarditis in the 16 to 17 year old. It was rare in, in, in that group, which was the highest group, boys 16 to 17, the risk of myocarditis was one in 5,000, but it was real. Um, the good news, not that there's ever good news about myocarditis, but at least this kind of myocarditis, unlike viral myocarditis, you know, it's generally short-lived, self-resolving um, and, and um, transient, so that's good. Um, but you could understand waiting a beat. I could understand that. I don't understand it anymore. I mean, there are now millions of 12 to 15 year olds, but almost half that that population in this country have already gotten vaccinated. So now you know that if anything, the myocarditis risk is less than in that 12 to 15 year old than it was in the 16 to 17 year old, as was also true in, in Israel. So now you have that data, those data. So now you're going down to the five to 11 year old. Let's assume for hypothetically that that is uh, uh, the, the FDA allows for it to be distributed that way, and the, and the CDC recommends to do that. Um, you could understand waiting a beat. Let me just wait a beat here. I mean, there's, you know, 5 to 11 is a large age range. Um, the, there's a 5-year-old very different than an 11-year-old. Let me just see what happens for a million doses or two. You can actually understand that argument, but realize when you choose not to um, to vaccinate, it's not a risk-free choice. It's just a choice to take a different risk, knowing that every every week now, about at least 150,000, I think last week, were infected with about a couple thousand hospitalization a week. And we, you know, I'm, I was on service a week ago. I'm going on service again in a couple weeks. Our hospital has about five kids in the ICU last time I was on service. I mean, watch that. And you see that there are, are no risk-free choices, and there are never risk-free choices for the most part. A choice to do nothing in this case is a choice to do something. It's a choice to take a risk. And remember also myocarditis is, is a consequence of the virus also, So, and, and to a much greater extent, obviously, than the vaccine. So um, I, I don't get it. Uh, that was not a sound bite, but it was a rant. <laughs> oh, my sound rant. <laughs> uh, how can we get the CDC uh, to take down uh, VAERS? <laughs> I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a federal program. I mean, it's a consequence of the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. I think it would probably have to be an act of Congress. That would, it's not up to the CDC. Have to I think the disclaimer on the front there says it all, but yes. Uh, see from uh, Ralph Reed. What are the legitimate reasons for not getting the vaccine? Well, if you've had a serious allergic reaction to a first dose, that, that is a reason not to get a second dose. That's it. For the most part, that's it. I mean, you know, past history of Guillain-Barre syndrome, past history, even past history of severe allergies to medicines or foods are still not a contraindication to getting the vaccine. You just have to be, wait in the site where you've gotten it, a site hopefully where they'll have epinephrine available, wait for 30 minutes afterwards. Um, uh, that's it. There really aren't any good reasons not to get a vaccine, just a lot of bad ones. All right. Uh, Kevin Mocker. Uh, vaccinated, he's, uh, I think he's talking about himself here, vaccinated in May or June, uh, I'm sorry, vaccinated in May, June, two, to two doses of Moderna, got COVID symptoms on October, October 1st, tested positive on October 5th, now he's over it, how long do I wait before I get my booster? And same question with uh, Pfizer. This is easy. Kevin, you don't need a booster. You won. I mean, you actually, <laughs> that, that sequence, which is vaccinated then naturally infected is the best sequence in terms of uh, developing high frequencies of memory cells and broadest immunity against variants of concern. You won. You've just gotten your booster. Your natural infection was your booster. Congratulations. Declare victory. Bow out. 
Uh, there is the, the, your, your situation puts you in the best immune category of, of everyone. You won. All right. We can all be jealous of Kevin. Uh, see, so yeah, Dan and uh, McLean Jr., what is considered a serious reaction to the first dose? A so-called anaphylactic reaction, meaning uh, a decrease in blood pressure, increase in heart rate, um, you know, that, such that you require, uh, say, epinephrine, uh, you know, that, that, you know, shot of epinephrine. That's a serious allergic reaction. All right. Uh, that was our last question from YouTube. Uh, we got a, a couple of questions uh, for you personally. That we want to know how you're doing and also how Dr. Plotkin's been doing. Oh, well, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Plotkin's doing great. I mean, he's a man now in his mid 80s, um, sharp as a tack. He, he's remarkable, actually. I mean, I can't, I'm always word searching for things, you know, like like a slender yellow fruit, fruit banana. That's right. Maybe, you know, <laughs> like, uh, I couldn't remember the brand, word straw man the other day, you know, and, and I was trying to do, make a Wizard of Oz analogy. Um, not him. I mean, he's just right there. He's, you know, we, he, see, uh, the, obviously the chief editor of the book, Plotkin's Vaccines, which is a 1,600 page, 20,000 reference text. And he is heavily involved in that, getting that out. We're almost on that, what is the eighth edition? But he's, he's amazing. Thank you for asking. Um, I'll, I'll tell him. I suspect that might have been Susan Gerbic, but I'll, I'll tell him you said that. You are correct. So, well, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you ever need our help in the skeptical community, uh, we will support you as you've uh, supported us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. We'll see you on the news, I'm sure. All right. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. All right.